Hello, welcome to our Facebook Live on this Friday evening. Thank you guys so much for attending. I am super excited about this topic. I'll be honest, I tried to jump the gun and ask her a lot of questions <laughs> before we went live, but I'll make sure we cover those again. Uh, we are so ready to share this information with you. Today, we have Chelsea with us from Positive Futures, and she's going to talk to us about all these things about can I cross? Candy Cross. Candy Cross? Yeah. Yeah, I find, I don't know why, it seems challenging. So, Chelsea, how long have you been into this sport? Uh, I have been doing Candy Cross for about eight years. So, we started, oh, wow. yeah, we started uh, just after we got our first Malamute, and we were kind of looking for ways to enrich his life in some, you know, breed specific ways. And we ended up coming across mushing and, and Candy Cross. And so, we've been doing it ever since. Wow, I had no idea you had been doing it for that long. Yes. <laughs> it's been around a while, I mean, for sure. But I feel like people don't really know what it is. So can you share with us what it is? Yeah, so can across is a sport that you can do with your dog. Um, and it's running with your dog, but it's a little bit more technical than that. And so it is a dog powered sport, which means that your dog is going to be running out in front of you and there's specialized equipment that you have to have. But basically they are out in front of you, pulling you, running with you, and you give them different cues to help turn them right, turn them left, slow them down. Um, so it's really, it's a, it's a very um, relationship based sport, which I like, you okay. know, you've got to have trust with your dog and you've got to um, have different cues that you've built up before you guys hit the trails. Okay. So a lot of communication, lots of communication, <laughs> yeah. a lot of prep. Um, yep. So you mentioned, you know, you got started because it was a breed specific thing with Malamute. Yep. Um, what breeds do you see commonly in this sport? You know, originally you did see a lot of those um, stereotypical sled dogs, so Huskies and Malamutes, but now it's really a nice sport that welcomes everything. You can have, you know, you could do it with your little toy box terriers. <laughs> um, I've seen people do it with dachshunds. I've seen people do it with, yeah, hound dogs, you know, so they're Dobermans, Golden Retrievers. Basically, if you have a dog and your dog likes to run and you like to run, then it's a sport for you. Okay. Wow. I, yeah. <laughs> just the visuals. I know. Some of those breeds like, I know. What? <laughs> and I want this to be very interactive, guys. So I see some of you are posting some questions. So I'll hold those for a moment. Um, but I will check in on those and make sure that we cover those as well. Because we have really great attendance. So kudos to you guys for showing up on a Friday night to learn something new with us. Yeah. So, <laughs> you, you know, you said um, that it's a dog powered sport. So the dog's pulling you, mm -hmm. um, what origin, you know, what caused this to be something that people are interested in that we don't have snow around here in Georgia very much. Yeah. Yeah. So originally, you know, speaking of snow, originally that's where the sport came from. So okay. a long, long time ago, people used dogs for transportation purposes. Um, you know, if you think of the movie Balto, which kind of a lot of people can uh, remember watching, uh, dogs were hooked up uh, with a team and they were out in front of a sled and people would use the sled and the team of dogs to get from place to place where maybe weather didn't permit travel by other means. And so um, in the early 20th century, this it kind of uh, changed gears a little bit from the need of transportation to competition. And so people had uh, big teams of dogs that they would train for these races. So lots of people know of the Iditarod, which is kind of the big thousand mile race in Alaska from Anchorage to Nome. Uh, and so, but what happens, you know, when we don't have snow, how do we keep those dogs fit? How do we keep <clears> them <throat> conditioned? And that is where dry land mushing kind of came into play. And so they had to figure out a way to keep these dogs fit um, not only, you know, cardiovascularly and muscularly, but also mentally. And so people would train their dogs uh, hooked up like sled dogs to bikes, which is the sport of bike joring. They would do carts and rigs. They would hook them up to four wheelers and they would run with them too. And so that's where Canacross comes in. Okay. Um, so now the sport has kind of taken a turn and now people are um, branching off away and, and they're, you're seeing, you know, non- sled dog teams doing this sport of can across and generally it, you're running with one sometimes maybe two dogs hooked up in front of you um but you know that's why it's kind of nice because you don't need snow and so really you can do it <laughs> majority of the year where you know where most people live uh on dry land 
Okay. And so, you know, before we got started, I was like, okay, so there's mushing and, you know, urban mushing and then there's kind of cross, like, how does that all lay out when you think about like the different sports and how they connect? Yeah. So mushing is kind of your, um, at the top, that is, you know, dog powered sports with sleds and snow. Um, and then underneath that, you'll, you get uh, dry land mushing, which is all mushing activities that are not on snow. And that can be bike joring. It can be scootering can be done with a rig, can be can across, um, four-wheeler, basically anything that's going to be on dry land. Urban mushing is kind of another subset from that because urban mushing is generally done more in urban settings, so more in the city a little bit. Um, but, I, you know, I am part of a local urban mushing group, and we do try to get out. Um, you know, ideally, we're running the dogs on softer terrain. So we do get them out of the city um, as much as we can, you know, to run them on that softer surface. Okay. And you mentioned rigs and bikes. And I think, have you been with like a scooter before? Yeah. Yeah. So you've seen our scooter. Um, And so that's, you know, truly dog powered because you can kick it a little bit, but there's not a whole bunch of help you can do. (laughs) Okay. Um, With the mountain bike, um, you can pedal along and kind of help the dog when it gets a little bit more challenging. Um, but a lot of people do bike joring too, and that's kind of another uh, subset of dry land mushing. Okay, so there's quite the variety depending on maybe what your um, athletic abilities are yeah. and interest. Yeah, right? absolutely. You okay. know, and there's a little bit of a crossover, like some people that do can across also do bike jor or scooter, and then there's some people that just focus on one of those sports. Okay. And do you find that the people who are into um, Kennecross are really into running initially? Is that what starts them down this path? You know, again, there's kind of a mix, you know, just like you'll have recreational runners and then you'll have runners that are trying to get new PRs at local races and and 5K events. Um, You kind of have the same within Kennecross. People that maybe kind of like me initially, we're looking for an outlet for their dog's energy. We're looking for a way to kind of get their dog out moving a little bit. Um, And then you have some people that are, you know, diehard runners and were into running before they even had the dog in the mix. (laughs) Um, But, you know, again, that's kind of the really nice thing about it is that you can have that range of people that just go out and do it casually all the way up to people that are, you know, training for and, and reaching for that new PR at each race they go to. And do you find with um, these sports that people have certain goals in mind? Are there competitions for this? Like, you know, we have 5Ks. Do we do Mm -hmm. this for dogs as well? We do, yeah. So actually, um, this year is the first year that Atlanta has had any can across race events. So that's been pretty exciting for us. Uh, We had one in March, and then we actually have another one tomorrow. Um, And those aren't um, sled dog sanctioned races, but they are can across specific races. So um, it's involved with the Dirty Spokes production races, and they're having a separate can across event, which is awesome. so yeah, there there are races for Canacross beyond just races that are pet friendly and allow people to run with their dogs. Okay, and how long or how far would this like competition be? Um, so most of them here in the states are a five k, which is three point one miles. Um, over in Europe and parts of Canada, where the sport is a little bit more well established, you'll have a variety of lengths. You know, they have some 1K, they have some 3K, they have some 5K. So um, mm-hmm. they'll kind of split it apart based on what kind of race they're doing. Okay, because they have, that's really where it originated, right? Was not here in the mm-hmm. city. Yeah, yeah, it's still pretty new here in the States. Um, You know, like I said, Georgia just got their first two races this year, which we're really excited about. Yeah, you've been doing it for eight years. Like, (laughs) so long, I know, right. (laughs) Um, But yeah, it is more established, um, you know, where mushing has been more established. So even in the States, you know, further up north, they they have a lot more in-person can across races than we do down here in the South. So we're trying to spread awareness and, you know, get more people involved in the sport because the more demand there is for it, the more local races that we can have. So. Yeah, absolutely. Now, it's funny because you said in person and I know I've been I've been guys, I've been following their group. They are 
I, I don't even know. Like I, I met some of these people through Chelsea. They're super <laughs> active. But then they were like, my virtual race. Like, did I read that right? You did. Yeah, okay, virtual so race. Tell, tell, <laughs> so that in person, <laughs> like, hold on. We're going to run virtually. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> virtually in my <laughs> brain. Right. I'm <laughs> running with you. <laughs> Tell us about that. That Yeah. So, you know, like I said, it's new to this area. And so for us that are just kind of dying to get out there and race and run with our dogs and support the sport, um, there's a big race organization called Can Across USA. um, And they are kind of our our main um, network for hosting races and spreading awareness about the sport here in the States. And so the races that they have further North, they will give you a virtual option. And so for us that haven't had the opportunity to run those in-person can across races, we have the ability to run virtually. So we'll sign up and you can, you know, track with a Fitbit or an iPhone, you can track your speed and distance and send it in so that they know what your time was based on everybody that was there running it in person. Um, And so, you know, I'm pretty lucky because I've got a network of people that I'm connected with. And so we'll actually all meet up together and run the virtual option of the race, but in person together. So we still have that camaraderie and we're all out there on the trail together. Yeah, that's super cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great way to connect. You know, I mean, if you can't do it and I mean, there's probably people watching tonight that, aren't here locally, that maybe they're out there on their own doing this and they don't have a group and they can join in too. Yeah, absolutely. it's pretty awesome. Yeah, it is. It is. So what do people need to know before they just get out there and start running their dog? I mean, we could probably go on for hours about that, but what are some main things that are really important for people to know just getting started physically? Yeah, so... Well, physically, there's there's obviously training that needs to go in for both the human and the dog, um, but there's also equipment that's really important. So I'll maybe start with the equipment and then we can kind of hit on the training too. Um, you know, the, the most important thing you're going to need from a human standpoint is a good pair of shoes. <laughs> um, <laughs> most of our running that we try to do is, like I said, on softer surfaces because we want to reduce the impact on joints, not only on the dogs, but also on the people. And so you're going to need a good pair of trail shoes or shoes that have, you know, really good rubber sole to them. Um, And then in terms of equipment for the sport, you're going to need a good harness for your dog. Um, And this is a very specific harness. So it's not a harness, Mm. unfortunately, that you can just pick up at your local pet store. Um, It does need to be a mushing specific harness. They're designed a little bit differently, um, allows, you know, full deep breaths from the dog, allows full range of motion from them when they're running. And the point of attachment is actually further back. So you actually connect your leash um, or your line, you know, further close to their tail. Um, Yeah. And then you're also going to need a belt for you. So this is hands free. (laughs) You're not holding a leash. The dog is attached to you. So you've got a special harness uh, that goes on your waist. And then um, you will connect the dog to you with a bungee line. So it's kind of like a leash, but it's got a little bit of a bungee uh, in the middle of it, which allows for some shock absorption uh, for both you and the dog, you know, when they take off running and and pull hard against that harness. (laughs) Okay. And so (laughs) they're really pulling you. I mean, you're running. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But they're pulling you. Correct. Yeah. Okay. You okay. want the dog out in front of you, um, pulling you into that harness. And so it actually does, you know, help help you run up those hills and help you get better, better times than when you're running without a dog. Okay. <laughs> They're like your own personal coach. Exactly. <laughs> Motivating you. You better keep up. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Because they always run faster than that, even yes. a slow dog. For yes. sure. yeah. So physically, what are some things we need to keep in mind for the dog when it comes to is my dog physically capable of this aside from breed and age? Yeah, absolutely. So um, obviously age wise, we want to make sure that growth plates are closed. So we don't really want to be running young puppies, Um, but you can start training puppies on direction cues and get them used to, you know, line out so that they're used to being out in front of you. Um, And then physically, besides that, we just, you know, I would recommend that people check with their local vet just to make sure that your dog is healthy. Um, 
you know, if we have any hip issues or knee issues, obviously we don't want to run and put extra pressure on a dog like that. So a vet right. check is always a good idea. Um, and then just like with people, we want to make sure that we're slowly increasing. Um, we don't want to just go out tomorrow and run a 5k if we've done no training at all, you know, take it slow, take it easy and watch for signs of soreness or changes in gait, because that would be, you know, a good indicator to you that you would need to head back to your vet and have them check that out. And I would think too, because, you know, I wouldn't say that I'm well versed in all dog sports by any means, but you know, vets don't always know what different sports are. So my thought was like, pull up some YouTube videos, right? And yeah. Like show them because you could say like, oh, I'm going to run with my dog. Uh huh. And they have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, Absolutely. What you're doing it for, right? Yeah. And then remind them when you're showing them that video of, you know, the world championships that it's a little bit lower key than that. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And I didn't really think about, you know, so many people want to run their puppies because I think like there's so much energy, yeah. but they're just they're too young. And you have to make sure with your vet that they are d pretty much done growing. And it depends on breeds, right? Yeah. Yeah. The absolutely. Little guys versus the big guys. Yep. Those bigger dogs take a little bit longer for those growth plates to close, you know, but it does give you a nice window where you can still kind of work on all of those cues because the dog does need to know a lot of words before you get out there and you're able to do it. So there's still a lot of foundation and groundwork that you can lay safely with a puppy, you know, before those growth plates close. So it doesn't mean you can't do it. You just have to do the right kinds of things. Correct. And do you do some fitness things at home um, in between running? And what kinds of things do you recommend? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we actually go to a local veterinary uh, rehabilitation center. Um, and so they've helped us learn some things at home to do. So we make sure that we're doing some mild stretching um, on a regular basis with them. We also do proprioception. Um, which is teaching them where each body part is. So we want to make sure that they know where their front end is and where their back end is because improving their body awareness will help reduce the chance of injury. Um, and then we do some strengthening exercises at home too. So we make sure that we're working the core. We make sure that we're working the quads of the dog uh, to make sure that they're strong and able to pull us. And then actually a big part of can across and you know all dry land mushing is cross training so swimming hmm. is great exercise for them hiking is great exercise for them and the stronger your dog is and the more well balanced they are you know physically actually the easier that can easier and safer safer that can across will be for them okay that's cool yeah i didn't think about you know cross training i mean all dogs would benefit from that but especially if you have a specific sport in mind yeah yeah and up. you know like it's hot here in Georgia. <laughs> you know, it's hot most of the year. Um, and I've got big woolly Malamutes, you know, so they've got not actually woolly, but they've got a lot of hair on them and they get hot, <laughs> you know? And so we're doing a lot of cross training. We do a lot of swimming in the summer to make sure that they stay fit and we keep those muscles in motion. Um, because, you know, this time of year when it's starting to cool off is really when our season is kicking in. Gotcha. So it's really training year round if you're really mm -hmm. going to have this, you know, really well-rounded dog. Yeah. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Awesome. Well, let's check in with some of our questions because I, you know, we're just getting a ton over here. <laughs> Let me scroll all the way down. I hope I didn't cover everyone's questions, but I feel great, guys. Like, I just love this. Um, all right. So we have some people, like, giving some shout outs, which is always fun. Um, so I, I have to show some of these, like, you know, I, I don't run. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they would donate the dog, right? So, Sonia. so if anyone's looking for a dog to run. <laughs> I'm sure some some people are. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And uh, we've got some other people tagging other people, which is really smart. So be sure to share this and tag people that might be interested. Um, I see a lot of that. So that's great. And um, it looks like, you know, Meredith uh, likes running and biking. So it would be a good combination. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Oh, and, and fancy leashes. You know, that's something in the dog world. We like equipment, don't we? We, we do like equipment. You probably don't <laughs> want to see my stash of can across equipment. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe another day. <laughs> oh, goodness. And then uh, someone else's huskies are making them watch. Nice. So that's always good. I tell you what, those huskies need jobs. So make sure they are they making do. them watch. Yeah, they do awesome. need jobs. So, um, so we did ask this question, but we're going to talk about it again. So does it... 
um, work for all kinds of breeds. It absolutely does. You know, all all sizes, all shapes, as long as the dog enjoys being outside with you and you enjoy being out with your dog, then yes, all dogs can participate. Yep. And uh, Anna's got some dachshunds liking it too. Yeah. So that's yep. always fun. <laughs> um, and do you still get a workout too? So Chelsea, when your dogs are running you, you're just, you're just like trotting along, right? Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> no. And you know, it was actually funny because we recently went out um, and, and did a 5k race. I think it was last weekend. And I actually got the biggest workout at the beginning of the race. <laughs> from resistance training like <laughs> the dogs were so excited to jump off that start line and I was like huh I guess I need to work on their easy because <laughs> just trying to hold myself upright while they wanted to go but yeah and, no you and then you need to work on more resistance uh, yes and then I need to get physically fit <laughs> um, yeah. but yeah no it's definitely a workout you know heart rate wise because you're running and, and muscle wise too actually beyond just normal running because you are you are running with the team, and so there there is a lot of muscle involvement. Yes, and and you know, and that's when you go out and do those things. You learn a little bit more about what yep, you need. Absolutely, right? every, every single talk. time. All right, so um, you know, this is an interesting point. So make sure that you go through your own directional command. So are there? This is. I'm going to ask an additional question. Like, are there certain commands that everybody uses, or is it kind of whatever you think? I mean, is it yeah, just you know. <laughs> Obviously, there there is some variation. You know, some people go with just right and left. Um, a lot of people that are, you know, hardcore into the sport will go with the sledding or mushing commands. And those are the ones that I have taught my dogs. Um, okay. And there, I think there's probably about 11 different cues that we use on a regular basis with them when we're out. Wow. Um, yeah, so there's a lot. There's a lot that you go through. Um, should, you want me to go through them? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, one good one that you want to start out with is line out. And that is teaching your dog to move out to the end of the line and keep pressure on it. And so when you're running, um, and especially important if you're doing bike drawing, you want the dog out in front of you before you even get started. Um, so that's kind of a move out in front and stay where you're at with pressure on the leash. And then uh, we have our right and left cues. And so in the uh, dog mushing world, that's G and haw. So G is right, haw is left. Um, and then you can, yeah, yeah. Um, you can go even further than that too, because sometimes when you're passing people on the trail, you know, it's not a true turn, but you want them to move over. And so ours have G over, which is move over to the right side of the trail. And then ha over, which is move to the left side of the trail. Okay. Um, you also want to have like kind of a sprinting cue. So, you know, when you see the finish line ahead of you, you want, and you want them to kind of pick it up and go fast. Um, so some people will use hike for that. So they'll go hike, hike, hike. Um, some people say, let's go or get up. And so that's kind of one where you can pick what kind of flows off your tongue a little bit. Okay. Um, and then if you come to an intersection while running and you need your dog to go straight, we've got straight ahead. Uh, you obviously want your dog to know their name and have some kind of recall because at some point you might want your dog to come back to you. Uh, maybe if you're passing another dog or if you see a dog off leash and you need to stop them to kind of get more control of them, keep them closer to you while you're passing somebody. Gotcha. Um, or critters on your trail. Yes, absolutely. A deer or, you know, squirrels or something like that. Yeah. If you want to prevent, <laughs> prevent getting jerked, um, you would need to call them back to you. Uh, you also want to have an easy cue. So if they're going too fast and you want them to slow down, I say easy. And you know, it helps to slow them down if you say the word how you mean it, right? <laughs> You're right. Um, we also have a stop cue, which is super important. So you want to make sure that your dog can stop completely. And for that, we say, whoa, get them down to a stop and then, and then reinforce them. Okay. Um, so those are kind of some of the basics right that you, that you might need while while going out there and wow, so yeah. we yeah it's a lot it's a lot um but we teach all i teach all of those you know with the clicker i teach them on on the ground you know not even attached to anything and then we start using them on walks and then eventually you're using them while the dog is out in front of you okay you know you keep going through here uh so jamie's asking can you start slow and work your way up 
Absolutely. You that's definitely what, can. That's what Chelsea recommends. <laughs> that is what I recommend. Yeah. <laughs> Don't be going right up for there and doing it all on the weekend. Yeah. So, you know, starting slow, even meaning like starting while walking, right? Because that's going to give you a little bit more control over your dog. So you could practice this while walking. And then, you know, as you're feeling more comfortable, as your dog is feeling more comfortable, slowly start working your way up speed wise too. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, Abby's asking, you know, are the dogs susceptible to injury if they're pulling us? That's a great question. Yeah. So obviously, if you've got any weight that they're pulling, you know, it could increase um, chances of injury if we're not doing it safely, if we're not doing it well. So the harness that the dog has on, like I said, is is very different than a harness you would use for loose leash walking in the neighborhood. Um, it's specially designed to allow them to have full range of motion and be able to pull to the safest of their ability. Um, but obviously we wanna keep a close eye on how our dogs are feeling. You know, if, if I pull out that harness and my dog doesn't go, yes, let's go for a run. I'm gonna keep them inside, you know, and I'm gonna keep an eye on them. So we definitely wanna watch out for body language. Um, but while we're working our dogs, for sure, there's always a chance of injury, even just running without putting pressure on. You know, so we always want to keep exactly. a close eye on them. Yeah. And they'll do things that they wouldn't, you know, they would just, there's three legs and they would go, right? Like if they left yeah. doing it, you just, you have to be really in, in tune with your dog. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> okay. So I, I knew this question was going to come. I'm glad Beverly uh, put it out there because it was on my mind. <laughs> <laughs> so I taught her to work on not letting her dogs pull on a walk. You talked about walking. You talked yes. about running. Yes. How do we know uh, on it? How do they know? How does the dog know? Mm -hmm. Typical walk. Don't pull me. Yep. Can it cross? Pull me. <laughs> yeah. Pull me as hard as you can. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm that's so a glad Beverly brought it up. It didn't have to be me. <laughs> yeah. No, that's a great question. You know, I'm, I'm a dog trainer too. And so obviously I teach my dogs how to walk on a loose leash. Um, and that's really important. You know, a lot of the dogs in this sport can do both. I think it's important for the dogs to do both. Uh, one big indicator for them is going to be equipment. So just like we may say sit and that's a verbal cue for our dog or we might give a visual signal and that's a signal for our dog to do a behavior. Pulling out the equipment is generally a big indicator to our dogs what they're going to be doing. Mm -hmm. So um, I actually loose leash walk and can across with harness. Mm -hmm. But the harnesses are different. So when we're doing can across, they're using their X back harnesses that were designed for it. And when we go out in the neighborhood, you know, we're using a rough wear harness or a perfect fit harness that looks a little bit different. And the dogs, that equipment can become, you know, a big clue in to the dogs of what they're about to be doing. Um, the other thing is going to be the cues that you're using. So when I go out and loose leash walk in the neighborhood, I have a cue that tells my dog to kind of get next to my left side and I say with me. And so when I say with me, they'll kind of pair up next to me, not in an obedience heel, but a little bit of a, you know, position one side. Um, and that's their indicator that we're going to be doing that. And I get, they get to stop and go sniff, you know, and then when we're practicing can across, we've got the very specific cues, you know, hike, get up, let's go. It's a little bit higher intensity and we've always trained the specific cues with that equipment. And so, you know, combination of the, of the two, let the dog know what they're doing. Yeah, um, and they, and they can figure that out if you're really yeah. consistent, right? Yes. Yeah. And consistency is key. You know, if you've worked really hard on getting your dog to walk on a loose leash and now you're going to let them pull <laughs> just under certain circumstances, I would say there's a good chance that they might um, maybe pull when you're starting to do loose leash again. So just make sure you bring your food back out with you and start reinforcing that loose leash. But they can they can definitely understand both concepts. Yes, I totally agree with you. It's like, you know, when your dog people who worry about nose work and say, well, I don't want my dog sniffing on the agility course. Well, yep. don't put your agility, you know, ha have different setup. Your energy, I'm sure, is different, Chelsea, when you yeah. get out there to run or yeah. you're going on a nice walk, right? Yeah. Like, you're different. Mm -hmm. you're, even your equipment might be different, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Let's get, we got some really good questions here tonight. Thank you guys for, uh, you know, taking in those questions because I don't have to do them all. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, JD's asking about, you know, starting training as far as learning how to properly start them. We talked about commands. Um, are What are some resources? Obviously, you're the resource for this. Um, but, you know, 
where do people get started? What resources are out there? And, yeah. and what do you have to offer? <laughs> yeah. Um, so obviously you're welcome to contact me um, either through my business page or or through my personal page. And I'm happy to help direct people, um, even if they're not local. You know, I'm happy to help connect them to people in their area or even online resources. Um, there are some companies over in the UK. Canny Fit is one of them. And she does offer online coaching so she can help people in that aspect. Um, and then for local people, um, I'm a co-admin for a group called Georgia Urban Mushing. And Can Across is one of the things that we do. It's one of our forms of urban mushing. And so in our files, um, you can find us on Facebook. And in our files page, we have a whole different section on training. And so it goes through how to teach different cues to your dog, what equipment you might need. Um, and we are always welcome, you know, beginners and newcomers to our, our events. And like we said, you know, we love equipment. And so we have lots <laughs> of extras. Um, we're always happy to loan people and kind of show them in person, help them fit their dog. So, you know, even if you come out to the, the first meetup and you have nothing, we can help you guys with equipment and help you get started. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. Now, do you, so long distance, I'm totally like, I have no idea, guys. But do you do long distance learning where you can help people with the cues, right? Yes, absolutely. Awesome. Yep. Okay. Yep. I do virtual training, you know, online training. We do Skype sessions. So I could definitely help, help people that might not be local or, you know, in person for those who are local, help them teach their dog all those different cues that we were talking about. Yes. Cause she's totally a resource. Not it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so thankful for that because it's something that, you know, that's your specialty. Is, yeah. And that's something for you guys with puppies. If you want to get started, that's where you got, you know, start those cues, like Chelsea said, and work on that loose leash walking versus running, all that. That's yep. so good. All right, you guys are rocking the question. Somebody, I think, did, but I was trying to look. Somebody may have posted, there's uh, the Can Across International, but if um, someone else wants to go ahead or I'll post it later post the group here that would be amazing because like I said a very interactive group everyone that um, I've met from the group they've come to different fitness events and things they have been nothing but you know kind and just really want to have fun with their dog and that's what Chelsea and I are all about and our teams are all about is having really really good relationships with their dog and this is just one other way to do it is to do it through running and and biking and things yes. as well yeah, yeah, absolutely. Always welcome newcomers. You know, you maybe maybe you're not even back into your running plan yet, but you're interested. You're still welcome to come out, you know, reach out to me or the other admins in the group, Georgia Urban Mushing. And we are so happy to help you guys get started on that. Absolutely. Thank you for that, for sure. Now, are there ways that people um, who aren't maybe into running <laughs> <laughs> who um, can support the group um, through other means, like, you know, going to different events that, you know, eventually, hopefully this will take off more and there'll be more opportunities. But what are some ways people can get involved and support the dog community through the sport? Yeah, absolutely. So um, actually at our, our race that we attended last week, we actually set up a booth um, okay. where we had, you know, little educational things out there. We have a little promo video that shows the group doing all the different sports. So if you aren't into running but want to support it, you're always welcome to come out and, you know, help us with that kind of thing. Because um, all of our runners were <laughs> that were <laughs> doing the booth were also participating. So we had to close the booth. So you're welcome <laughs> to come out and help us with that. Um, and if maybe, you know, you're interested in getting into the sport, but you weren't into running yourself, you know, like you could get involved in bike joring or scootering and try one of those out as well. Um, and then if you want to be a part of, you know, the active dog community, um, we are an AKC Fit Dog Club too, Georgia Urban Mushing okay. is. And so we do group hikes too. So maybe you just want to come out and go for a nice nature walk with us and explore, you know, we're, we're planning those events as well. Those are awesome. Yeah, which yeah. I, would, I could totally hide. I could totally yeah. Hide. <laughs> Come and join all, us. And all the snakes go away. <laughs> yes. Yes. I love. And that's so important, too, Chelsea, like not only just learning about this sport, but having that community to do things with because finding like-minded people to hike with or do mm -hmm. these other sports is just priceless. It's just such a nice way to have your dog be around other dogs and other mm -hmm. people um, and just have fun. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's decompression for us and for our dogs, you know, Absolutely. getting out of the city a little bit, getting into nature and just being able to enjoy other people who like the same things and, and like their dogs. It, it is, it's a different kind of friendship. 
Yes, absolutely. And I, I totally want to support that because I know that it helps so many people, you yeah. know, when we get to meet with our dogs. All right. So let me look through these questions again. We've got, you know, people are like, urban mushing is awesome in Georgia. <laughs> That's so great. Um, and Beverly made a comment. I, I'm not going to post it on here, but basically she was like, my husband either really needs to learn how to train the dogs to run or I'm going to have to start running. <laughs> <laughs> well, come on. Well, you can join us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I think her husband would be game to join you guys for sure. Um, so are there consideration differences for small dogs? Yara, yeah, I want to know. What are some considerations for the little guys? Yeah, well, obviously distance is going to be a big part, right? So it might not be as much effort for a big dog like a Malamute to go run three miles. It might be a lot more for a little dog. So we would definitely want to take the conditioning component into consideration, making sure the dog is fit, um, making sure that the dog is healthy. Um, you know, some small dogs can be brachycephalic. There's more dogs, you know, and that's the smushed face. So <laughs> for those of you that don't know, um, like pugs or bulldogs, so breathing obviously comes into consideration. We want to make Absolutely. sure that the dog is healthy in that component. Um, but besides that, you know, small dogs can be just as good. They might not pull quite as hard as a big Malamute would, but you're still going to have the same equipment with them. You're going to have a harness that's safe for them to run in. You're still going to have that bungee line and then a harness for you as well. So okay. you just you just might need to pull yourself up the hill a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> right. Or borrow Malamute for the yes. hill. <laughs> hook, up, hook up a two-dog team. We'll, we'll hook <laughs> yeah. up a little dog to, to Lennon. <laughs> That'd be hilarious. Um, <laughs> and Anna says she's running with her 10 pound dachshund and she loves it. I, I need to yeah. see photos and videos of this. It's pretty I'm sure great. it's adorable. It is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when people are getting started, what are some additional things that people should bring along with them aside from the harness, the leash, you know, good shoes for us? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I always bring along snacks for both the human and the dog. Um, we don't really want to feed the dog in, um, you know, close timing to running. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll use, you know, a little bit of a cookie as part of my warm up if I'm doing some neck stretches, some back stretches. Um, and then I always want to reinforce them after they're cooled off. Heart rate has gone down for getting back to the car. Right. Okay. <laughs> a lot of the times the dogs can love being out so much that kind of when the fun time ends, that can be a little bit punishing or a little aversive for them. So I it just good habit. I always reinforce my dog for, you know, getting back into the car, back into the crate <laughs> when the fun time is over. Yeah. Um, I also always bring along poop bags. Obviously, you're going to want to make sure that you're ready to clean up after your dog. We want to keep our parks clean. Um, and then I'm always bringing along lots of water, usually more than I need. Um, but I always like to be prepared. And again, the water usually doesn't go along with me on the run because we don't want them drinking a ton. Um, but once that heart rate comes down, I do want to make sure that I have that water for my dog to help them cool off and rehydrate. Okay. Awesome. Um, okay. you know, and then, and then one other thing that I, I usually have, but I don't use often would be some kind of like paw butter, um, which is kind of like a waxy substance that you could put on the bottom of your dog's foot, uh, helps protect them against the elements. Uh, the brand that I use is Musher's Secret. I don't use it that often, but if there's ever, you know, a surface where maybe I'm not sure how much, you know, abrasion it might cause on the dog's foot, maybe it's something a little bit rougher. Um, we don't really have much issue with salt around here for the right. snow, but that would be another circumstance when you would use that just to give them a little bit extra protection. Yes, absolutely. And probably, you know, depending on how long or how far you're going is, and this is good for any time you're taking your dog somewhere, but ID, first aid kit, you know, yeah. things that you should probably have. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah. Yeah. And those, those I kind of keep in my car, you know, non-specific to mushing activities, but I do, I always have identification for my dog. I make sure that I have, um, I have a little in case of emergency thing on my crate that has my dog's picture. It has some emergency contact info just in case something happens, um, you know, and vaccine records in case, again, something happens and my dog ends up having to go to a vet. Um, they would have all that information. And then I do have a first aid kit, you know, with some hydrogen peroxide, some antibiotic ointment, some Benadryl, just in case they get bit or stung by something. And those are things that just stay in my car all the time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. We got to be safe. Yeah. All right. We got a couple more questions here. All right. So uh, we want to talk about reactive dogs. So this is a good topic. Yeah. It hasn't come up yet. Um, you know, how realistic is to try to get them to kind of cross with dogs that, and that's a lot of 
adrenaline and energy. Mm -hmm. So what do you think, Chelsea? Yeah, I think it depends on the handler's ability. I think that the sport is great for reactive dogs. Um, actually, my my female dog, Lucy, she can be a bit reactive. Um, she gets a little frustrated and she gets aroused when she sees other dogs. And so it can amp her up a little bit. Um, but with appropriate management, appropriate training, she is able to even, you know, handle the race environment. So I really think it depends on where your dog is kind of in their reactive journey and how confident you feel. And then just being smart about it, you know. If your dog is reactive, you totally can still go out and do the sport, but some dogs might not be suited for that race environment. And that's okay. It doesn't mean you can't do the sport, you know, and some people want to just participate and they don't care about the races and that's good too. So it is a great outlet for dogs, even if they are reactive, but you need to know your dog, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you're on a narrow trail and you're, you see another dog out in front of you, you know, maybe you wind your leash up a little bit and hang onto the harness as you pass another dog, or maybe even move off the trail to give your dog a little bit of space, because we always do want to respect the space needs of your dog. And if they need that, then you just need to be smart about that. Absolutely. And uh, if you need help with that, contact Chelsea or I, <laughs> yes. uh, depending on where you're located, because yep. You know, we want those dogs. I mean, a lot of times they need things to do. Mm -hmm. um, but like you said, we really need to be smart about it. We can't just yep. say, well, they love running. Let's just take them yep. out with our friends and socialize them. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. Because as as you and I know, you know, socialization, that that's that's not how we do it. Um, <laughs> right. But yeah, we, we just want to be mindful of each dog. And um, there are some people I have seen that do run their dogs in basket muzzles, you know, that they haven't had an issue, but it's just in case they bumped up on a, a dog that was maybe off leash, you know, maybe somebody wasn't respecting leash laws. And so there are different precautions that you can that you can take, you know, to make sure that your dog stays safe. Absolutely. And even a lot of sight hound people, anytime they run their dog or that they're, mm -hmm. you know, they might nip somebody out of excitement. Yeah. Which is, we want to teach them to safely wear it. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Because it's a high arousal activity. You know, just you mentioned sight hounds, just like lure coursing and fast cat. It's mm -hmm. an activity that gets their heart rate up and gets them amped. And so even dogs, you know, that that aren't aggressive can have trouble if they accidentally bump into somebody when they're in that kind of excited state. Absolutely. Yeah. And we don't want anyone to have any question as to what our dog's intent was at that right. moment. For sure. Right. All right. So how do you condition your dog when you don't have a dog running group nearby? Remember, you can do it virtually. Yes. Um, <laughs> and we just talked about reactive dogs. So you're totally on the right page with us. Um, so what are some additional things that you do? We talked about, you know, some of the fitness things that you do, some stretches. Um, what are some other things you might do with your dog, like cross training, you said? Yeah. Yeah. So you definitely want to make sure that you've got kind of um, a routine in place and can across is kind of a unique thing because you have a fitness plan for your dog and you have a fitness plan for you. And sometimes that's overlap, meaning you guys go out on a three mile run together. And sometimes actually a lot of the times it's separate, making oh, sure okay. that, um, you know, making sure that you do your at home exercises to keep, keep the dog in shape. Um, so yes, you want to do, you want to make sure that you've got some stretches in place, um, some at home conditioning. Um, you know, I talked about the sit to stands and working on proprioception. Um, we might put the dog on a little pedestal in front of us and have them pivot, which would work on strengthening the rear end and it would work on proprioception. Mm -hmm. um, so reactive dogs, you can do all of that with them because all of that's going to take place in the home. Mm -hmm. um, and then with a reactive dog and all dogs that you're conditioning for it, you want to make sure that you are doing that cross training like we mentioned before. So swimming is a great exercise when weather permits. Hiking is a great exercise for them. And those are even great for reactive dogs because it means that you're getting out of the city, right? You're getting away from a lot of those triggers that usually set those reactive dogs off. Um, you know, a lot of places have pool rentals. I know that you guys are connected with um, a place in Brazelton that mm -hmm. rents the pool out. There's there's so many of them. There are, yeah. The yeah, for sure. Yeah, and so, you know, swimming either in a lake or a river or in a pool that you can rent out would all be excellent exercises. Um, and then, you know, specific to a reactive dog, I would make sure that we do have a training plan in place, um, you know, working with a certified professional trainer where you can work through some of these reactivity challenges um, just to make sure that you're setting your dog and you up for success because this is a specialized sport, but we do wanna make sure that we have that behavior component in mind as well. 
Absolutely. Looking at the whole dog, not yes. just one aspect of it. And so, Chelsea, what are some things that you personally do for yourself? So you said running separate from your dogs, which I find difficult to even go for a walk without a dog. I know. <laughs> I know. It's, it's not that way? fun. <laughs> Can you like put some hearts in the comments so that I know I'm not the only one who feels guilty <laughs> going for a walk with just another human? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, when I'm going out and working myself, my dogs need rest days. So there are some days where they, you know, stay at home. They'll go on a walk, of course, a little one going sniffing. Um, but I'm making sure that on those rest days for them, it is low impact. So I'm not taking them out running um, either with me or with the bike. And that's really important because they need those rest days to recover. Um, those are generally the days where I'm getting my Chelsea specific time. Um, <laughs> so I actually do work on proprioception. You know, I've had a few surgeries on my legs and so um, my body awareness is certainly not as good as my dogs. And so I do at home exercises to help me with that. Um, and then all of the, the training that you do together, right? The hiking is going to work you just like it works your dog. Um, if I'm going swimming, actually, that would be a great cross training exercise for the human. <laughs> um, probably can't do that that well with the dog. Um, <laughs> and then I actually do yoga too, because it helps all of these exercises build the muscle up, right? And then normal stress gets in the way. And so that helps me kind of relax and, and alleviate that tension that my body will carry. Yeah, um, but, absolutely. but lots of people, you know, work with running coaches. Lots of people will work with their own personal trainers to help um, them condition their bodies as well. And so, you know, if you're, if you're real into it, you know, that's great. Yeah. Cause you have to take care of yourself. I know it's, easy yeah. to you know hire someone for your dog yes but we have to take care of ourselves too and yes. are there training plans online or resources that kind of give you a general you know i think of like couch to 5k mm -hmm. humans there's something like that for our dog you know i have been searching and i have yet to find a dog specific couch to 5k unless you're going to go with a virtual training option where the trainer is going to give you a specific plan for you. Um, okay. But, you know, those free online training plans for people, you know, you can use that for you to help condition you and then bring the dog along with you um, and then just be mindful. So the one thing I want to make sure I'm doing with Canacross is that I'm not burning the dog out because I always want them to have enthusiasm for it. Right. And right. I can mentally push myself like I can go. All right. I, you know, I've only got a mile left, <laughs> but my dog doesn't know that. And I don't. <laughs> Want them to, right. I don't want them to ever feel like, oh, we're doing this again. Um, and so one thing that I'm really mindful of in the training plan um, as I'm conditioning my dogs is that, first of all, they always want to go out with me. And if they ever say no, I say, OK, that's fine. Um, and then I always want to make sure that they're still enthusiastic while we're doing it. And if I ever see them start to get tired or start to get overheated or start to go, oh, I don't know about this. I, I walk and, and I'll actually switch equipment to the collar or to something that indicates that we're no longer pulling so that they can kind of rest and recover and, and they don't feel um, you know, less, less enthusiasm to do it. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, you can use that human training plan to help you get started. And then again, just make sure that you're connected with your dog and you're watching your dog so that you know when it's um, too much for them um, and and reach out. You know, there are a bunch of people that can help you condition your dog. You can reach out to certified canine fitness trainers. You can go to a canine uh, rehabilitation center and they can help you with those ground exercises that I was talking about, you know, the fitness component of it. Um, and then reaching out to, you know, trainers that do can across because they can help you put together a specialized plan for you and for your dog. Absolutely. And I'm glad that you mentioned that about all the different, you know, rehab people mm -hmm. and, and fitness trainers, because in our area, we have a ton of different people. And so look it up, talk to your primary care vet, mm -hmm. um, and they may be able to refer you to someone, um, because I know we have a few just in yeah. our, our little area here. Um, yeah. You know, and I've, I've definitely utilized a couple of them myself for keeping my dogs just in shape or the older ones. Mm -hmm. And they just, they know so much. They do they can really help you use stuff at home but, to yeah. keep them fit. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, you know, worry about, you know, we think of, um, human rehab at being expensive and being this huge undertaking, but I, 
a lot of people that I talk to are really surprised how much knowledge they can get from just one session, you know, so mm -hmm. go in and talk to them and tell them what your goals are and they can give you some basic stuff that you can do at home, you know, for the next year. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that'll help keep your dog healthy and, and make sure that we're not having any issues. Absolutely. And even just to get the baseline for the dog, I did that yep. with the, you know, with Norby. Um, mm -hmm. Initially, if you're going to get into this, this would be really good insight for that person to put their hands on your dog and know, yes. okay, this is what you need to do. So you need to work on it. Maybe check in once a year, every six months, depending on if there's any changes. Absolutely. And then you know yeah. what's happening. Yeah. And a lot of people, you know, um, a lot of people can look at their dog moving and not notice those small areas of tightness mm -hmm. or small areas of soreness. And so you might think, oh gosh, my dog's in great shape. And, and he might be, but there might be some areas um, that we need to focus on to help make sure that the dog really is fit to do an activity like this. And so, you know, like you were saying, even just that one checkup to go, oh, did you know this is a little tight here? And you go, gosh, no, I didn't. And so then they can give you exercises that are specific to help with that. So you can run with them longer. Exactly. Too. Yeah. Exactly. Just little muscle differences, tension, like you said. Yeah. Um, and even there's so many, you know, we just had a massage workshop. There are so many people who are certified to do, you know, canine massage too um, yep. in, in the Atlanta area. And so looking those people up, sometimes it's the rehab person themselves, but just another way to kind of help your dog uh, be well-rounded. And I think Absolutely. we all need this, even if we're not, doing a physical sport with our dog, a I dog agree. powered sport, yeah. they all can benefit from it. And it, like I agree. Said, it isn't that investment is so worth it. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it really isn't that much. <laughs> yeah. when it, when I it know comes when it comes down to it, it really isn't, you yeah. know, because being proactive and making sure they're in shape can help prevent, you know, a cruciate tear ligament <laughs> down the road, which is going to be way more expensive and, and painful mentally and physically for you guys. So it's, it's worth the investment. It is so worth the investment. All right, well, there's some people doing some shout outs here. We've got a shout out for Cindy Robert, who um, we both know and love her. Yep. And so good that you have her. It knows work is great with her. And then also you've got the fitness component as well. Yep. I see more and more trainers getting that information now because mm -hmm. so many people are, you know, even if they just wanted to have fun with their dog, I mean, I know I do that at home. If, if I yeah. could show you my messy uh, floor right now, you'd see my fit paws and my yep. pods and, you know, things to do when the, when it gets dark out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For uh, sure. Too, we've got a whole fitness room of, you know, different fitness equipment. We've invested in a dog tread this year. So that was big for us. But yeah, lots of people, even just pet people are doing, you know, fitness with their dogs at home. It's fantastic. Yeah. So we will both put some links into the comments. Um, I have, I've got some ideas for Chelsea in my head. So I'm going to give her some projects after this of all the things she could do to, uh, continue this for you guys as well because she's such a wealth of knowledge and I so appreciate your time tonight. Um, I know we both have busy schedules but this is so good because I learned a ton and I know all of our viewers and viewers in the future will learn a lot so keep sharing this information because I think it'll be valuable to so many people. Any last words Chelsea before we say goodnight? I would just say that if you're interested in it come check us out because we're always welcome to, you know, we always welcome new people into it. So if you're interested at all, please let us know. We're happy to help you get started. Um, you know, it doesn't matter where you and your dog are in your fitness journey, you know, come on over and we'll help you. We'll help you get started. It's a ton of fun and it's a really wonderful way to, to bond you even further to your dog. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much. And we're going to sign off. Have a Thanks guys. Time, guys.